for coming tonight and supporting the uh, grand opening of Veda Yoga. This has um, been in the working for all of about a month and a half. <laughs> the seed had been planted um, about a year ago by my dear friend and teacher Tukaram Prabhu, who's in the back. <laughs> he would say, Kumi, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just teaching yoga classes. He's like, you should open your own yoga studio. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't really want to open a yoga studio. <laughs> he didn't too push it too much at first, but um, over time, with each request, there was a little bit more, um, more, a little bit more enthusiasm. Kumi, you should open a studio. No, I'm not really ready to open a yoga studio. Kumi, you should open a yoga studio. I don't have any money to open a yoga studio. Hey, Kumi, you should open a studio. Okay, I'll open a yoga studio. <laughs> so. Here I am, and uh, as soon as those words came out of my mouth, it just was about one month later, everything kind of came together. Um, the money, the funds, the space, um, and I really have no idea how it all happened other than it's just a, a pure miracle. And um, all of you being here is a, is a miracle as well, and I'm so grateful and honored and getting ready to cry. <laughs> that I want to thank also um, my parents aren't here they're in Colorado but um, without them and without their support and without them their unconditional love and raising me which was not an easy job <laughs> um, this wouldn't be possible and um, without Tukaram Prabhu this would not be possible and without Radhana Swami this would not be possible so thank you from the bottom of my heart I'm so grateful and I'm honored to be introducing tonight's guest speaker who has dedicated his entire life to the path of bhakti yoga. Um, the mission of Veda Yoga is to provide affordable education, guidance, and instruction on the scientific principles of yoga as originally taught in the Vedic literatures of ancient India in order to <coughs> assist individuals and society at large in reaching their full spiritual potential. <laughs> and I can't think of a better person to guide us on that path than our special guest tonight, Radhana Swami. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Gary. <laughs> and thank you to the Gandharvas for the amazing Kirtan. Let's give a round of applause. I was at Ross earlier today and I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't really looking for it, but I saw this bright orange beanbag in the corner. I was like, oh my God, that's got Radhana Swami written all over it. I had to get it. It was only $20. Thought you might be able to see everyone a little bit better. <laughs> Swagam Upa Kadamaya Tadati Swapa 
is my great honor and my great fortune and happiness to be with all of you this evening. Thank you for coming. This is a historical event. <laughs> what is the name of this place? Veda Yoga. The inauguration of Veda Yoga. <laughs> This back, and more people can come in this way. Prabhupada 
as his personal secretary for about three or four years. He was with Srila Prabhupada in very early days in 1966 and beginning of 67 in San Francisco. Actually, Sham Sundar is one of the people who helped to create Hate Ashbury. Mm -hmm. Do people of your generation know about that? <laughs> yeah. yes. It was the Mecca, the Jerusalem of the counterculture. There, he witnessed the transformation of so many people's hearts. And Srila Prabhupada was living in Vrindavan, holiest place for devotees of Krishna in India. And in the 50s and 60s when he lived there, it was a very simple forest with the Yamuna River flowing ancient temples. There was hardly any shops. There was no hotels. There was just some little ashrams, some farmers, and a lot of sadhus, holy people who lived there. And all the residents were very, very simple people who simply loved Krishna and Radha the land of bhakti. Even when I went there in 1971, it was still very much like that. Srila Prabhupada came from that place where he was mostly in seclusion or with very, very holy people, deeply studying the scriptures and translating them and writing purports to them in the English language. And he came to America to share those great teachings. And this 71-year-old holy man was in Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. During Sham Sundar's Prabhu's research, he's probably done more research about those days than anyone in history. Spent months and months and months going through newspapers and every possible way to get more and more insight and information of what happened then. One person was Rock Scully who was manager of a band called the Warlocks. <laughs> yes. And later they became, he renamed them the Grateful Dead. I was sitting here in New Dwarka at the temple in Culver City. And I was just in a little room that Swabas Prabhu gave me. And Sham Sundar called me. And we talked for a couple minutes, and he said, could you hold on for a moment? I'm getting another call. I said, sure, just call me back. No, he said, no, just hold on. I said, no, no, you just take the call and call me back. He said, I'll call you back in two minutes. An hour and a half later, he called me. <laughs> he said, you won't believe who called me. I said, I'll, I'll believe you if you tell me. <laughs> he said, you won't believe it. I said, no, no, I won't believe it. Okay. He said, Rock Scully. <laughs> he said, I believe you, but who's Rock Scully? <laughs> he said, you don't know Rock Scully? I said, no. And he told me who Rock Scully was. It's a long story. You have to read his book. If you want to read it. 
He was his roommate in Geneva, in Switzerland, and he came back to establish Hate Ashbury. He brought some things with him, too. <laughs> But when he later, actually Shamsundar was looking for Rakskali for many years. And somehow Rakskali called him on the phone. And they had scheduled a meeting in Monterey, California. And the day after that meeting, he came to see, we were walking in a redwood forest in the San Francisco area together. And he told me that Rock Scully, who was one of the founders of Haight-Ashbury, who lived there throughout, he said, Prabhupada, of all the different spiritual leaders that came, and everybody came in those days, he was one of us. He lived among us. He accepted us for who we were. He was one of us. He was part of our family. What Sugar Prabhupada did to transform people is he saw the potential in us. Because according to the Gita, Najayate Mariyate Vakadachit that the true self, the soul, is eternal. It's never born, and it never dies. Why do we fear death? Because it's a totally unnatural experience when we are eternal. For the body, death is totally natural. Every physical body has to die. So why do we cry about it? It's as natural as the falling of the leaves in the autumn season in the north. I don't know what happens here in country. <laughs> it's as natural as the waves yeah. coming to the, to the shore of the Pacific Ocean and ceasing to exist. But because the Atma the living force, the soul, is beyond birth and death. It's really an extreme thing to die when you identify with it. The soul is such an ananda. Why are we so much against pain? Because our nature is to always be happy. Ananda, it, that's what the soul is. Pain is a completely unnatural foreign experience for the eternal blissful soul. But when the soul forgets its own potential and identifies with, with things that are subject to suffering and death, it's a very, very difficult experience. And the ecstasy of the soul is to realize that we're all part of God or Krishna. And to love Krishna is the real happiness that everyone is seeking. Yeshua Bhagavat tells that when you water the root of the tree, the water naturally goes to every part of the tree. Similarly, when we realize that love for the divine, for Krishna within our heart, it naturally extends to every living being. Beyond any sectarian conception, love of God extends as compassion in a universal way. But due to the ahankar, due to the ego, and due to so much conditioning of identifying with so many misconceptions. I'm man, I'm woman, I'm black or white or red or yellow or brown, or I'm from the east or the west, or I'm 
Ramaswamy or a Wall Street financial business person or politician. We identify with all of these conceptions. And we become so caught up in that. Even in perhaps our particular religion in an external way. That we forget the real happiness that's within ourselves. But when enlightened people come into our lives and they see our potential, they see our spiritual nature. Because they believe in that, through realization, they actually convince us of what we could do. Because in order to uncover the eternal blissful soul from all of the illusions and all of the ignorances of this world, we have to take to a spiritual process. Lord Chaitanya explains, Chaito Dharapanamarajana, that the mind is like a mirror. And the purpose of the mirror is to see ourself. But when the mirror is covered with layers and layers of dust and dirt in the form of all of these desires and attachments and aversions and fears, that's all we see. And that's what I, we identify ourselves with. So the practice of true yoga is to clean the mirror of the mind. But in order to do so and stop putting more dirt on it, it means a certain change of our life, change of our values. And in order to take that step, there needs to be some faith. Where does that faith come from? By associating with people who actually see that potential within us. Rampo was in Haydash Ferry, the Shad Sundar and these other hippies. <clears throat> and he saw and he convinced them that they were eternal, blissful beings who could transform the world with love if they just access that love within themselves. And that is the beauty of satsang. We could all be instrumental in helping each other to realize our true potential. Thank you for writing this wonderful book. It's going to be about four volumes. It was a beautiful story of Lord Chaitanya when he was traveling in the southern part of India. He came to a village and one very, very learned, wealthy person invited him to his house. And by Lord Chaitanya's association, this person became so inspired. He said, I want to leave my family, leave my occupation, and follow you wherever you go. Lord Chaitanya turned to him and said, never speak that way again. <laughs> He said, there is no reason or need for you to change your position in society. 
just change your consciousness. If you remain home with your family, your occupation, with devotion to Krishna in the center, by purifying your heart through the chanting of these divine names, Krishna's holy names, and sh living as an instrument of what you find within you, that compassion. Then your life will be perfect. There's no reason to change the externals. And Srila Prabhupada, in his translations, he reveals to us that this was the message Lord Chaitanya gave wherever he went. Just a couple days ago, it was the um, a day where we celebrated one great saint whose name is Bhakti Vinod Thakur. I'd like to say something briefly about him. He had 12 children and his wife Bhagavati. The two of them were such saintly people. He was, at the end of the 19th century, a magistrate or a judge under the British rule. He would try his cases with such precision, with such comprehensive um, notes that the British government would give him the most difficult cases and they would send him to different places where nobody else could actually deal with it. Sometimes there were situations so volatile only Bhakti Vigdhan Thakur could do it. Because he had such courage. He had such insight. He actually built a railway track from his house to the courthouse so he could try more cases. And even if he found somebody guilty, that person would feel blessed because they understood he really cared about their welfare. He was really seeing them with compassion. And although he had nice properties, he had a house in Gautamukweep, a house in Jagannath Puri, a house in Calcutta. The most renounced Babaji's Sadhus, yogis, swamis would come to hear him speak and receive his blessings. One such Babaji, very renounced ascetic, named Gorkishore Das Babaji. I'll give you a little example of how renounced he was. Sometimes if he was very hungry, he would reach his hand in the river, Ganga or Yamuna, depending on whether he was in Mayapur or Vrindavan, and he would just get some mud and eat it. He was a very simple person. <laughs> and he had no inclination whatsoever toward material enjoyment. He was totally engrossed, immersed in his bhajan or his spiritual activities. But almost every day he would walk barefoot 
to the house of Bhakti Vinod when Bhakti Vinod would be speaking from the Srimad Bhagavat, from the scriptures. He would go to hear from him, to learn from him, and to receive his blessings. <clears throat> He wrote one beautiful song of Bhakti Vinod. Grihe tako vanne tako Sata hari pole tako Sukhe tukhe pulo nako Badane harinam korore Now whether one is with a family, husband, wife, children, or whether one is a swami living in the forest, if one lives in a spirit of seva or service and one sincerely calls out God's holy names, then one can rise above all the happiness and distress of this temporary world. When people love things, there's something seriously wrong. We should use things and love people. But when we love things and use people to get it, then our life is in a terrible misbalance. So yoga is to harmonize the body, the mind, with the love of the soul. And bhakti yoga is <clears throat> creating that harmony, or, re, or let us say reawakening that harmony through a spirit of devotion. That whatever we have, we recognize as God's problem. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, I'm the intelligence of the intelligent. I'm the strength of the strong. I'm the ability in all living beings. So we utilize all these things in a spirit, not of selfishness, but of seva, of service. That's our nature. That's where our real happiness will be. All of the problems in the world that we see of conflict are due to missing this point. Srila Prabhupada wrote in the Srimad Bhagavat that although in the world today science, technology, economic development has, expand, has expanded beyond imagination, still there's some kind of pinprick that's still creating so much conflict and suffering. Because no material arrangement could really solve the problems that are causing humanity such pain. Only a change of consciousness can do that. We are very grateful the Veda Yoga Center has been created to, to actually help us to see that potential within ourselves. A place where we could gather together to create this harmony of the body, the mind, and the soul. Grateful hearts, our hearts are receptive to access the grace that's coming within our lives. Lord Chaitanya explained that there's a seed, the Bhakti Lata Bija, the seed of love of God. 
it awakens when we come in contact with people who see that potential within us. And when that seed is there, if we water it through our spiritual practice, in this age of Kali, especially the chanting of God's names, the seed grows. And when the, fer- when the soil of our heart is fertile through gratitude and humi- humility, then our spiritual practice really makes that seed sprout and grow. And when the fruits of love will ripen, and to taste that fruit of love and to share that fruit with others is the true happiness. Anandam Bodhivartanam that we're all seeking. So we're very grateful.
another round of applause. everybody for being here at Peace the World and we're excited to be serving the community. We're offering uh, two weeks of free yoga for everyone that comes through the door. Um, after that we'll be having some $10 drop-in classes. So please come out and uh, thank you all so much. Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! <laughs> yes, oh, thank you. And for those of you um, who would like to continue the journey home. Radha Swami has written a book called The Journey Home. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be available in the back of the room. Um, it's an amazing read. I think I read it in all about two days. Uh, just what an inspiration. And if you want to learn more about Bhakti, you want to be inspired by the words um, and by the story of Radha Swami, I highly recommend this book. Um, it's available in the back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuntali Devi. Devotion, enthusiasm, determination, and faith. Desire to be an instrument of compassion has manifested as the Veda Yoga Center. <laughs>
hours do I work? And she says, um, about, I only work one body part a day. So I only do, I do weights for about an hour, hour and ten minutes, depending on what body part. You know, like a small one. But, you know, like legs will take longer than arms. Shoulders are quick. I mean, you never 